Good evening. Welcome to Tagney Jones Hall for our opera talk for April. And welcome both to our in-person audience and to those of you joining us on YouTube. I'm Jonathan Dean. And uh, before I get going, let me uh, remind everybody that uh, Seattle Opera and Seattle Center are here on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish. Uh, this reminder, this acknowledgement is a reminder to all of us to strive for uh, respectful relationships with all people as we work toward reconciliation and healing. We're here tonight for The Marriage of Susanna. Uh, yes, it's, the opera has another title, but we all know what it's really about. And I'm really, really excited to have with me some singers and a opera director, tenor, uh, uh, and we're going to uh, go at this opera in a lot of different directions. There you go. Uh, and a Duchess, of, yes, actually, I should, let me start by introducing, and I should say um, to everybody that when you come to Marriage of Figaro, in, which plays, I think, May 7th through the 22nd, I think I've got those dates right, but they're on our website. After every performance, there will be a post-show Q&A with uh, members of the company. Um, however, what's fun tonight is we have two people sharing a role, which you weren't going to get when you come to the post-show things. So, and so the marriage of Susanna tonight, we're really looking at the Susanna eye, Susanna bird's eye view of the universe of Marriage of Figaro. Let me also point out to those of you who are following us on YouTube, um, use the chat to ask questions. Um, we're going to talk and talk and talk and talk, and then we'll be taking some questions both from our folks um, here in the room with us, and then we'll also get those questions that have been written in, read out loud. All right, let me uh, introduce our special panel of Susanna experts. Um, right here is Soraya Mafi. Soraya, who comes to us from Manchester in the north of England, and who first appeared in in Seattle, oh, three or four years ago, uh, at the Seattle Symphony, as a bird, as a bat, and a squirrel, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, shepherdess. the shepherdess, as a, as a piece of torn wallpaper, potentially yes. wearing a big paper hat in L'Enfant Les Sortilèges, which the Seattle Symphony did in concert, and then you came over and joined Seattle Opera and had your Seattle Opera debut in Turn of the Screw as Flora. Uh, and also came back a couple years later for Gilda in Rigoletto, one of the, I mean, fantastic acting, but uh, an exquisitely sung Gilda as well. So we're very excited to have Soraya Mafi back in this um, uh, different flavor kind of character than Flora or Gilda. Susanna come, has a happier end, at least, mm -hmm. in this opera. Uh, Peter Cazares, our director for Marriage of Figaro, is not playing the role of Susanna, but he kind of is, because Susanna is really the director, or at least maybe the stage manager, of behind the scenes in Marriage of Figaro in the Castle of Aguas Frescas. Peter Cazares um, uh, made a Seattle Opera debut in 1985 as the worthless playboy Stefa in the only ever Seattle Opera production of Yenufa. He went on to sing... Oh, lots of operas uh, and lyric tenor roles, but I would describe Peter's particular specialty as being tenors with a brain. Mm. This is not uh, something you should always take for granted. Um, Peter's you know, most memorable performance is Loga, certainly in the Ring Cycle, who's kind of the mastermind, and I believe you once said the actual hero of the Ring Cycle. Uh, Captain Veer and Billy Budd, Pierre in War and Peace, lots of these sort of the thinking man's tenor. And Peter's directed dozens, dozens, you know, dozens of operas, both here and at uh, UCLA, where he is distinguished professor now and uh, sort of in charge of the whole opera program. At Seattle Opera, most recently, Turn of the Screw. Uh, I think before that, The Consul. He's given us a lot of really dark, creepy operas. Uh, American Dream. And uh, An American Dream, an opera that had its world premiere, which you gave us twice. But you're actually also <laughs> one of the funniest men I know, and have done a lot of great opera comedies, including um, The Funniest Barber of Seville that I've ever seen, which we did uh, here uh, a lot of years ago. Um, ten. ten years ago. Ten years ago, uh, Barber of Seville, and now... Uh, the actually, 11. I the think sequel. 12 was Butterfly, <laughs> but yeah. Um, Peter, you, uh, one of the things, when you were uh, running the Seattle Opera Young Artist Program, you directed the earliest opera comedy in existence that was the only time Seattle Opera ever gave, La Serva Padrona, which starred Anya Matanovich, who was then a, in the Seattle Opera Young Artist Program and has done lots of uh, shows on the main stage as well, Marcelina and Fidelio, uh, Gretel, I think maybe most recently, in Hensel and Gretel, um, uh, Magic Flute, you were, you were uh, uh, one of the, the three ladies. Um, uh, I don't know if you remember playing Serpina, the, the world's first ever opera comedy, the opera buffa, Ser Padrona, the, the, we called it The Maid Becomes the Misses. 
and it's about a very you know, sly Italian woman who's kind of lower status who ends up deceiving the rich guy and getting him to marry her. So I don't uh, uh, Of course I remember that. <laughs> that was one of my first experiences. I was actually here as a young artist, and the role I was singing was Flora in Peter's Turn of the Screw. But then I got to do something really fun, which was this the La Sevra Padrona and then Nanetta in Falstaff the next year. But I think um, Peter's staging of that had more people in stitches than I have ever experienced. The, yes, don't you remember with Josh doing the singing while he was in the shower, and I mean. It was really funny, I and mean, this was an opera from like the 1730s, and we all thought who could possibly right. find something oh, yeah. funny about something that old, but, but you guys did manage to, uh, um, it was great also a fun. Great cast, <laughs> great cast, that is always the answer. Um, a great cast, and obviously Marriage of Figaro, a big ensemble show, and there's lots and lots of fantastic singers who have joined us. We just started rehearsing earlier this week, but we want to really want to focus in on Susanna. For Sopranos, Susanna is sort of a special role, isn't it? I don't know, maybe you, you could start by each of you telling us your past history with this. I mean, first of all, it's one of the biggest roles that you sing, isn't it? I'll take this. Um, yeah, she's, I think, the longest soprano role in opera. Um, and I'm not sure if Anya might agree with this, but it's it's not so much the vocal stamina, it's that Susanna is always thinking and doing, and there's things to go in places and people to move around and situations to manage, and I think that's the stamina that is required for this role. It's in the thought more so than the voice. Um. Absolutely, yeah, I feel like um, at the end of the show, and I haven't done Susanna that much, but um, at the end of it, I feel like I could sing it again. It's one of those roles that actually, like, it, it doesn't sit in a place like Traviata that ugh, you feel like I need a week off. But, um, but mentally, it takes so much focus. And I think that's the, it's fun to do it with someone like Peter, you know, who's got the show. Um, uh, you've been talking about the clockwork of it. It feels like that's what's happening in Susanna's brain. It's like, okay. I have to do this, and then I have to do this, and then I have to do this. And, and if your brain isn't on, <laughs> rehearsal stops, <laughs> and the show would stop, so. I mean, this is partly the, what she does in terms of trying to get through, it's one day in the life, the, the subtitle of the opera, actually, I'm not sure if it's the subtitle of the opera, it's the subtitle of the play. The play was called La Folle Journée, ou uh, Le Mariage de Figaro, the opera Les Nantes de Figaro. Uh, the crazy day, it's sort of Susanna's crazy day. We start with her waking up in the morning and many, many, many hours later, and how many crises do you go through on the way there? I, uh, I've not counted. Lost count. <laughs> Would you uh, guys tell us a little bit about your previous history with this role? You've done it before, you, you've seen other great Susannas, you've studied, you, you've uh, stolen all their tricks. How does that work? Um, I was doing this role when coronavirus hit. And that was my first experience with the role. I had never done any scenes of Susanna, um, but I had learned her aria when I was 16. It was the first aria, opera aria I'd ever learned, given to me by my first kind of opera teacher. And um, I had to kind of revisit it and actually unlearn and relearn it um, with my proper voice, you know, my 16 year old girl voice. Um, so yeah, it was, it's a strange thing, um, revisiting a role that was, my pre-COVID contract, um, there was this kind of unfinished quality. And th that production, I mean, did it open that the production? Of we did. We have a f we had a few shows, um, and at Welsh National Opera, where Aidan Lang, who was um, d director here, moved to. Um, so we had we had a really nice time. Um, myself, the contests, uh, the Count, and the Figaro, we were all new to the roles. Um, so there was an interesting energy, and we also had a, a lot of time, um, which was handy because it's really, it really got it into my voice. But it's such a, it's a long role, it's a role with many layers, and I think, I mean, any singer with any role could apply this, but I think particularly with roles like Susanna, the roles that you hopefully carry with you, um, and are kind of stock roles in repertoire, they gr you grow with them so I'm a different person than I was two years ago um, and that reinforms this Susanna I'm working with a different director I'm working with a different conductor and it's really exciting in that to find new things it's not necessarily better or worse it's just different Anya you've done 
a handful of? This is my third Susanna. So my first was a, uh, about 12 years ago when I was five. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was in Madison. And we had two weeks to stage the whole thing. Everyone else had done the roles. I think Jason Hardy, who did it here, young artist, he was my figure. So everyone else had done it. I was new. And I was so grateful because everyone just, I, it felt like one big crazy day those few weeks. It was just, we staged it all out of order. And then the first time we ran it, it was exhilarating and a magical group of people. So I feel really lucky that I had that experience. The next production I did uh, was uh, in a company where the orchestra went on strike. So we had to do it with piano, which was not satisfying. And then it's been 10 years. So I'm thrilled to have the luxury of not just the four weeks, but having two casts. It's really a beautiful thing to be able to see the production you're in from the sidelines, right? To see, because we never get to see so often the productions that we're a part of, but to see how Susanna fits in has been a joy. And also coming back to it, I, I um, am such a different person. You know, there are some things that feel like they click right in and other, other things that I'm going to continue to rediscover and redefine. Peter, I'll ask you in a second about your, your prehistory with Marriage of Figaro, but let me add one more question for my Susanna's. And Anya, you, you alluded to it. Um, it changes depending on the director and, you know, who, who's there in the room. What, as Susanna, what do you want your director to be offering, and maybe <laughs> the, the the converse here, and you know, he can listen or not. Um, what do what 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 would you not be so excited about, you know, c director wise? Well, I have to say, I mean, to me, the director in every show is key, and and Peter is one of the greats. He is someone that I. It's been a long time since I've had the privilege of working with him, and almost every show I go. Peter. So I feel really lucky. He, what he gives us is a skeleton structure, you know, and then he watches what each of us bring to it. And we, it, it's a very collaborative process. And I trust him completely. And that's what I'm looking for in a director, someone who will give me a, a structure and then let me bring what I want to bring to it. Because Peter knows that my Susanna will be different from Soraya's. And that's a beautiful thing because what you want to see is truth on stage. You don't want to see what a, what's truth in Peter's mind. You want to see my truth. So he is bringing that out of each one of us. And that's what the great directors do. So really, that's all I'm looking for in a director. And we have it. Sorry, any, any yeah, I agree. It's the individuality with, with the cast members. And I can tell that Peter was a singer and has been directed. Um, himself, because he then understands what we need. Um, you know, us singers, we can be interesting personalities, and we can be working with other interesting personalities, and it's finding that the marriage of those different relationships, and in a piece like this, where there is a lot of geography, um, we had a moment today when you said, Peter, about, was it the Figaro delirium or something? Like the Figaro psychosis. <laughs> Figaro psychosis that directors and Susannas at some point will experience, because there's so much to manage, and um, it's having someone calm who knows, who just knows what to do um, in those situations to make me go, oh, let's just step outside of this. This is all very manageable. And it's like c the sense of chaos in a very organized way. And that's what Peter <laughs> brings for us. It's all of those, all those things that you have to like that shopping list that's in your head of which key to which room and who's mm. got the cloak and who's hiding where now and all of that stuff that just sort of, I don't know, I suppose if you're a chef and you've got a you know, whole bunch of meals you have to get out into the dining room, you know, there might be a little bit of that frenzy that, that Susanna is constantly in. But uh, Peter, I mean, I don't know, you sort of, you like, you like that kind of life, don't you? I mean, it seems to me that you've, you've always had a lot of uh, balls in the air. I, I like having a really good associate director and a really good assistant director, and I have both in Dave Tolson, who was working me, worked uh, with me on this production in, uh, in uh, Washington when we did it there. And... Um, He's doing both associate and assistant directing. And today he was, I said, take it away, because we were doing Non Piu Andrei, and there's a whole sort of coup de théâtre that we do between Act One and Act Two, which you will all see. And, um, and it's highly choreographed, and highly everything has to be right on the money. And this is the first day. I mean, it took us sort of two hours this afternoon to just start it. 
He's going to have another three-hour session with the Supers tonight. Tomorrow we are going to come back to it, I think, or maybe on, on Friday. But we, this, this one sort of six minutes of music takes hours of rehearsal. But that's sort of typical for this piece. And then there are other things that just, you know, what's great, singers sometimes complain about recitativo, but the really great ones don't because the recits are when you, which is when people are just talking to each other, um, it, that's when it's like a play. And it's easy to do whatever you want. It's not physically demanding. It's mentally extremely demanding because you have to change your focus every couple of seconds and sometimes numerous times within one second. Um, and uh, we were working, so some of that goes actually really quickly if you have your mind geared up the right way. But doing the big numbers is always, a, it's a thing. You know, one of the great things about this piece is the famous 18 and a half minute finale in act two, uh, which was through composed and which is a marvel. And uh, actually that's when I decided, I, when I uh, first did this piece, I'd already been directing for a couple of years and had directed Norma here in 2003, but I was directing Figaro in 2005. I had been doing a double bill of Suor Angelica and Gianni Schicchi at Hart in, in, um, in Hartford. It is in Hartford. It's the Hart College, uh, Hart Conservatory in Hartford, but different Hart. Anyway, then Deli Iolanta uh, um, at AVA in Philadelphia, and then I came straight here. I went from one to the, to the next to the next. And everybody was sick in Hart and AVA. I was not sick. I came here, and I was fine, and we began Act Two, and I was like, I don't feel so well. And the third day of Act Two, I was like, I really feel like crap. And I had like 102 fever, but it was before COVID. So I said, I am not going to not direct. I'm just, no one come near me. Everybody wash their hands and just stay 10 feet away. And they did. And I directed the finale to Marriage of Figaro with 102 fever and was able to do it. And it made sense. And I thought, this is a lot better than being an opera singer. <laughs> because, you know, if you have 98.8 and you're an opera singer, you're like, oh no, oh I can't possibly, oh I know, and I was like, no, I'm sick as a dog and I'm still gonna direct it. Um, so it's not what I would do anymore, obviously. I would, I would spare everyone the, the necessity of being exposed to my germs. That was but the first time you directed Marriage of Figaro. That was the first Bellevue, time, and that Washington. was when I had Figaro psychosis. But not because of the flu, that was Figaro psychosis. Figaro was psychosis is just that, like everybody. Well, well, look, in my case, somebody said to me once when they saw one of my productions, they said this is the first time Act 4 has ever made sense. Now, the reason Act 4 made sense for me, because I literally had to go, she takes the basket of, with the apricot and the little pastry, and she goes to that pavilion. And then this person goes to that pavilion. And then this person goes to that pavilion. So it's a kind of locked room mystery. You don't know who is where. Um, which is why, and that's why it's kind of delicious because in fact, the countess ends up in a pavilion by herself, and the count can't remember where he He's put her. He's looking for her in the He's other one. He's looking for her in the other Scardino, one, right. Here comes and here comes Marcellina, yes, and all these Mother, people. what are you right. doing in there? So, you know, there are lots of productions where people come flying out of trees, and it's like, okay, but it, that really doesn't make any sense. And I figure, I owe it to Beaumarchais, if, if not even to Da Ponte, Beaumarchais created a marvel of a, of a play. Um, Beaumarchais himself, whose father was a watchmaker, who was obsessed with timepieces and who literally had the strangest life, but who created this watch clock, clockwork piece, which is everything happens because something else has happened. Everything you remember from the plot of The Marriage of Figaro is in the play. Carabino hiding behind the chair, the count coming in, Carabino going in back of the chair, the count, the, or then Carabino coming to the front of the chair and the count going to the back of the chair. Basilio interrupting Susanna, that's all in the, in the Beaumarchais. Um, all the uh, twists and turns are in the Beaumarchais. All the things about, I'm really, I'm your mother, no, and he's your father, that's in the Beaumarchais. It's set up a little bit better in that because when they first come in, they say, remember we had a kid a long time ago? Foreshadowing, Foreshadowing your, your point, key point, to point, quality point. dramatic right, structure. Right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I just, I, I always reread the Beaumarchais before I do it, and I remember what I'm going to keep. I mean, one of my favorite things that I discovered in the Beaumarchais was, you know, people do different versions. And, of course, when you're doing Nozze di Figaro, you're not really doing Beaumarchais. But when you have a very tired count and a very tired countess who cannot stand to be in the same room with each other anymore, I've always felt that this sort of 
somehow it was not what the show was about. And when I read the play, I realized, to my surprise, because the Countess, of course, is disguised as Susanna. And as Susanna, she says to the Count, so how long have you been married to your wife? I mean, have you been married a really long time? And he goes, no, it's just three years. And she's like, and you fell out of love with him, with her already? He goes, no, of course I still love her. But, you know, basically, if you, if you can, you know, it just, after three years, it just becomes boring domesticity. It's like if you can eat at the same restaurant every night, then nothing is special. And, you know, then he goes into a whole thing about what women need to do to keep men interested. And interestingly enough, the, Susanna, uh, the countess, as Susanna's going, oh, that's interesting. And Susanna across the stage is like, what a jerk. And Figaro is like, oh, I can't believe it. So everyone is listening to them talk. Um, it's fantastic. And, of course, huge commentary on the roles of men and women in society, on the roles of status and of class and of wealth and of privilege. So that's all the way through the play. Uh, and those are things that are, of course, very, very relevant today. Anyway, long answer to your question. Tell us about your background with the piece. I mean, you, you directed it first in 05. Were you ever, did you ever sing? No. In it? No? No. Um, but I assume you probably went to it when you were young. And I, I cannot. I must have seen 100 performances at, at least. And I must have seen at least 20 different productions. Um, and I remember many of them. And Do you I, remember like a, an awakening to it? I mean, I, I remember for myself, the first time I ever uh, translated it for Supertitles for Seattle in 1997, I had seen it a bunch, but going word by word through it, that was like, oh, now I get why everybody is so crazy about this piece. Yeah. It was, I had to kind of, like, as you say, take it as a play right. and really get well, the text. I mean, the moment you sort of go, what is with the pin in Barbarina's, what is that about? And, uh, you know, all these things, you sort of, when you, uh, there wasn't one moment. I guess for me, it was when I first had to really direct it, and I went through it, and I had, a, started to have an appreciation of its form. Because to me, it's basically perfect. Uh, and I've also direct, directed uncut versions of it, where I've done it with Basilio Zari, and I've done it with Marcellina Zari, and they're, they're fun. And they work great if you, you know, the, the evening then does very, tend very to go long. on a bit. Yeah. But it's all right. I'm, you know, I had a sad moment when I first came to UCLA and we were doing Figaro, my second year there. And I said to one of the composition students, were you going to come see Figaro? And he's like, uh, I said, it's, you're a composition student. It's The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. And he went, how long is it? And I went, um, it's about, well, we're doing it uncut, so it's about three hours and 25 minutes. With an intermission, he said, oh, no, no, I can't. And I thought, ay, 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 ay. you know, what a, what a world, what a world. And I thought, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even bother. I thought, you know, if he doesn't want to hear Figaro, he doesn't want to hear Figaro. 18th century pacing, 18th century theater, it was leisurely back then. Well, it was also, I mean, it's so gorgeous. I was sitting there yesterday, on Tuesday, and also on Monday, we had two sync-throughs in the past, on Monday and Tuesday, and I was just like, oh, I'm listening to the finale of Marriage Figaro twice in 24 hours. And it's your job. And it's my job, and I'm getting paid for it. And there are unbelievably gorgeous voices in this room singing. And it's heaven. What a privilege. Oh, my God. To get to, to, get to do and that. And to hear it live, and it's not over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Now, for Sus Nothing against Zoom. Thank you, Zoom. <laughs> Susanna, uh, you know, obviously you've got uh, a lot of comedy and you've got a lot of stuff and business and running around. Do you guys ever actually get to relax and just sing that beautiful stuff? It, can you, maybe each of you, in Susanna's One Crazy Day, what is, is there a moment of, like, just sheer joy or kind of positivity as well as all of the I, I, to one, que one question for each of you. Um, what's the most stressful moment in her day and what's the most kind of rapturous moment in her crazy day? Mm. I don't know if, you, if who, um, <laughs> whoever, just jump in. Oh, so the most stressful moment, there are many. Um, I'm not sure yet in this production because we're still finding everything. Um, but for me previously, I find the most stressful moment the top of act three when Susanna has to um, essentially seduce the Count. The duet you sing with the Count. Yeah, because uh. it's, sh that she, that is to me the moment where it feels like she's having to have this real duplicity. 
and it, it, she's in an awkward situation. And do something that makes her really uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. And of the course Countess I'll meet has had you. to egg her on and, with and it. And we can just remind everybody that the reason you go and hit on him and say, yes, I'm yeah. going to meet you, is he doesn't know this, but it's setting up this um, scheme where you're not actually going to be there. It's going to be the Countess. Yeah. Whereas the, the previous scene I have with the Count, it's very clear that Susanna's saying, you know, look, me, you know, like, leave me alone. It's, this isn't going to happen. But she's giving him permission there, and it's just the two of them on their own. She doesn't know that, you know, he might consent and go, okay, well, I'll see you later. In, in that moment, who knows what could happen? And she's also having to deceive Figaro. Um, I, I, I find that personally the, the most stressful moment for Susanna. Is there a moment for you that's like the, the happiest part of Susanna's day? Um, there's two moments. Um, the, when she comes out of the wardrobe, Signore, you know, and like, it's, oh. This is in the Act 2 finale. It's, it's in the Act, when the Act 2 finale. finale shifts, yeah. when they start laughing. Yeah, the first Susanna, the beginning Susanna, and really you want all the audience to go, yeah. yes. <laughs> you know, and like, yeah, got him. Um, that moment is, is pure joy. And then um, the, in De Vieni, n not uh, the, uh, Susanna finally gets her aria, in act four, the, the final aria of the piece be before the finale in act four. And kind of halfway through the aria, I think, is when it becomes pure rapture. The start of it, she's still having a joke with Figaro, but then th throughout the aria, it becomes her singing of her love for Figaro. Anya, you've done this, this role several times. Tell us a little bit about singing De Vieni, that last act aria. I mean, one of the reasons why we do take cuts is because there's a lot of arias in act four. Mm. It's sort of aria, 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 and then another 20 minute finale. Susanna's aria is the slowest of all of them. W what's it like to sing that? I mean, we're, we're like almost about to end the piece and we have this like six minute long <sighs> aria. It's so simple, De Vieni. It seems so simple. It seems simple. <laughs> What's it like? Uh, well, I mean, it I seems mean, simple musically. It does. Uh, it's actually very, very complicated dramatically because, as Soraya says, it's sort of like yeah. the and subtext it's funny. shifts. It's like I, I've just. This is uh, going back to my first experience with this opera. You said you were given that aria. Um, just a side funny thing is that Helena, who's singing my Countess, and I, both of our first arias that we were ever given was. Um, Voi che sapete, Carabino's aria. It was the first piece that I was ever given, 14 year old, and I probably put my hand out like this and looked like, Look just like, like Carabino. Carabino. <laughs> <laughs> um, so De Vieni is, um, it's the most sublime moment. I find it very hard out of, to sing out of context the whole piece, because to me it is so perfect. It's the cornerstone of, it's what everything is leading up to for her, because, you know, the interesting thing, and we haven't gotten to this part in rehearsals yet, but it's the marriage of Figaro. They get married before the end of the piece. There's a lot more that happens, actually. To me, the most, um, Susanna's lowest moment happens after that. They're married, and then she uh, sings this love, it's teasing Figaro, but it's, it is a love song to Figaro. And then she thinks, after all of that, that she's betrayed you know after she gets all this far she's married him everything's gone off just as she's planned and then Figaro who recognizes Susanna's voice but Susanna doesn't know she's still pretending to be the countess <laughs> and Figaro decides to turn the whole plot back on her and pretend like he's seducing her and to me that is Susanna's lowest point it's just when, like when he's pretending that you're the countess and he's going to try to make out yeah. the countess yeah I mean I think you know I've been thinking about um power in this piece so much and how everybody uses their power differently and it's not just power of uh, status right that's just you know because the idea and I think about this is we're this lovely cast getting to know each other it's like if all of these people were born you know next door to where they were born they would all be sitting around at the inn having beer together or something but they were all born into these different positions. But Susanna and Figaro, they have, you know, power of intelligence, power of wit. Barbarina has power of beauty and youth. And Carabino has this um, wild kind of naivete that is actually power sometimes. And I think what's so fascinating to me is how in every scene, you know, someone uses their power and then they lose it and they use it and they lose it in all these different ways. It's just a joy. But... De Vieni is where it like, for just a moment, 
right? It's sort and then of it goes like, back. Though. Yeah, it's very yeah. like uh, Eastern somehow. We're in the moment here, and yeah. none of the rest of that stuff. Exactly. This is just nature. Yeah. That and then the moment where the countess forgive, uh, forgives the count. That's my other, I mean, favorite moment in probably all of opera. The Contessa Perdono at yeah. the very end of Act Four. I was just talking to Christina Chevalon today, and she said, well, of course, all my colleagues in Europe think, well, that he's not, sin he's not sincere when he says that. He, and I'm like, yeah, but he is. In that moment, he's sincere. That doesn't mean he's not going to do it again tomorrow. But in that moment, he's not lying. How can you lie with music like that? I, I mean, yeah, yeah, well, I suppose. Well, but it, what is, yeah, so you guys, as Susanna, you're a bystander. You're observing that moment. For you, Anya, it's a, a sort of a positive, it, uh, place to your optimism? I think so. I always try to find that in every role, right? I remember doing that in Fidelio. It's like, Fidelio sees Leonora do this and it emboldens her. And I feel like this, Marcelina. Marcelina. Uh, yeah, and I feel like um, it's the same thing because, you know, we were talking about this over Zoom a few weeks ago. Like, Susanna, when she thinks that Figaro has done this to her, she smacks him. She smacks him and beats him. And the countess forgives. This is the most gracious, beautiful extension. And, and the countess has something to forgive. As yes, opposed really to exactly. have anything exactly. to forgive. You know, it, yeah. it is one of the things that, that I kind of love about this, again, because I'm, you know, I deal with students who are in from 2022. So <laughs> Susanna thinks that Figaro is doing her dirt. What does she do? She smacks the crap out of him. <laughs> you know, and that certainly would not happen nowadays, would it? Um, you know, and he's, and you can't, he's going, Kiskiafo, you know, stop, stop hitting me. She's just like, pew, 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 right? So how politically incorrect is that? Extremely. Well, it's, it's also Falstaff. I mean, you were saying that, right. you know, let's, let's all, you know, beat up on the old guy at yeah, the end. That you know, that, that somehow is how this kind of comedy is always. But it's not, I mean, it's not because, I mean, in Falstaff, you can make an argument that it's like, you know, the lecherous old fat guy. Uh, so there's lots of issues to unpack there, is, being, is doing things he shouldn't do, lots of issues to unpack there, so let's torture him. Lots of issues to unpack here. Here it's a couple, and they're having a fight, mm -hmm. and she just hauls off and smacks him. And it's their wedding night. Excuse me, I'm calling, you know, <laughs> child protective services, except you don't have children, right? I mean, it's their wedding night. Well, it, it, but again, like clockwork, this has all been prefigured in a line that you sing, I think, in the very first recitative. Uh, one of the first things you say to, Sus to Figaro Susanna's is, Se tu mio servo o no? Yeah. Are you my servant or aren't you? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I know you guys have already done that scene. Did that just? Well, it just, I mean, we, it, that particular moment is he's like, what are you talking about? And she, I think what she's saying is, will you shut up and listen to me or not? And that's the thing is because Figaro is always yada yada. And she's <laughs> like, she's not a good listener. Cha. And she actually in this production literally shuts him up. And he's like, <laughs> and she's like, well, then let's talk a little bit about that uh, relationship. I actually want to ask you to, to talk about all of your, because you have a lot of, you have as the sort of um, hub of the wheel of Marriage of Figaro, all of the relationships go through you. And you have a powerful relationship with the Count, another one with the Countess, Marcellina, and you have a very Im important relationship. Um, but with Figaro, uh, you just married a man who's not, I mean, he's, he's brilliant, but he's not really very good at listening. Uh, why do you want to marry Figaro? We don't, there's, no, there's nothing in the libretto, I don't think, that says. Is that one of those questions you have to answer for your character? Well, what was the reason to get married in the first place? I think, you know, we chatted about this too a few weeks ago about um, there's a matching of uh, wit. You know, they're both uh, the same status, I suppose, but there's just like a wit. And so in joining forces, they are even more powerful, if that's the right word, or they're, they're, they are more of a force together when they can join their two wits together. You appreciate that there's somebody who's at least is on top of it yeah. and, who, and who has a sense of humor. Yes, that, indeed. That I think there's a, you know, you charm He cracks too. you up, yeah. even if he can be kind of a handful. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I, think, I think the humor is key. And the, the, the balance, they balance each other out. And I think that a much more modern relationship 
um, than the Count and the Countess. I think, you know, a lot of people could watch Figaro and see themselves and their partner in Susanna and Figaro, um, partly because we don't have the same class system as they did then um, in our current society. Um, but I think also, you know, when anyone is thinking, oh, is this, is this someone I want to spend the rest of my life with? They're going to keep each other on each other's toes, you know, and anyone who's been in a relationship with someone for a number of years, it's, it keeps it fresh when you have that humor with one another and that understanding. And even if, you know, I'm going to make this joke about you and you're going to make it about me, but underneath it is a love and a mutual respect. It's interesting you just said the, you're gonna, the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Go back to Barbara Seville. I don't think the Count and the Countess ever asked that question about, mm -hmm. are we going to get together and spend the rest of our life together? It was more, I can get out of Dr. Bartolo's house. Or, you know, it was a, a different sort of end game. Than you wrote me a nice letter, so I love you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get me out of here. Um, different kind of thing. Let's, let's talk about the Count and the Count and Susanna. And actually, uh, let me ask about this uh, uh, from the point of the, the theme in Marriage of Figaro of innocence. You guys have both uh, played Flora in Turn of the Screw for productions directed by Peter Cazares. And there's no more sort of vulnerable innocence and watch. Uh, you, can, you know, it's inevitable in that that this is going to get um, corrupted and perverted in this awful way that's going to make us all sick to our stomachs watching that opera. Um, is there, is innocence even an issue in Marriage of Figaro? Is innocence a theme? And we've, we have all this business with this white wedding veil and the droit de seigneur, which the Count in his great magnanimity has decided that he has, you know, uh, abdicated that right. But is that important? Or is that all just sort of a game that you're all playing in your, your status, in your, your jockeying for power and position and status in the castle? What do you, what do you think, where is innocence in this opera? I think innocence, it, it's, hmm, that's a tricky question. Susanna isn't an innocent as maybe Miles or Flora in Turn of the Screw start out as, I don't think. In terms of vulnerability. No, exactly. You know, she's she's smart. She's switched on. She's experienced. She, I wouldn't say she's experienced as, for example, Despina, who's a little bit more kind of jaded by the world in Cosi Fan Tutte, the, the other de Pont, one of the other de Ponte operas. Um, but I think Susanna's intentions could be seen as an innocent view of on the world or a hope of innocence within the love that she has for Figaro and their future together. And it's not a naivety, it's just like she has a really strong moral compass. And that for me is why I think the scene with the Count is really stressful for her. Um, and m more so, for me more so than later because she has a lot of dignity and she wants, she wants to do the right thing. And part of doing the right thing is being with the right guy and making the right choices. And she is constantly seeing people around her making the wrong choices, thinking, oh my God, I have to undo this and undo that and just get us all back on track so we can get to this wedding, I can get to the altar, I can wear my beautiful white veil, we can have this great wedding and I can go and live my life with this man. Um, I think her intentions come from a place of innocence. Anya, any thoughts on? I mean, I, I it's hard to, say if Susanna's innocent in that way. I mean, I think, uh, I think she sees innocence around her, like in Carabino, there's a certain representation of innocence, youth. Um, but I feel like Susanna knows so much about everything and what everyone is doing that how can she really be that innocent? You know, she knows, she knows what, the Count's been doing. I, it's why it breaks her heart. You know, we talk, w and we haven't gotten to this part in staging yet, but I still, I went, I'm like, how did, I have to think that she um, somehow by accident lets it slip with the Countess. Like, I don't think she would tell the Countess because in some ways the Countess that is your more, husband is hitting yeah, on Yeah, I think, I think in some ways the Countess is more innocent, yeah. much more innocent than Susanna. Except the Countess does have this little nascent thing going on with yeah. Carabino, which we know by the third play. Um, you know, the guilty the gu true. mother, <laughs> innocence is we've... Right, we've, I mean, yeah. she is definitely not innocent. Ca Carabino goes off to war. Carabino comes back. The Count is uh, on a diplomatic mission someplace. Carabino and the Count is having an affair. He goes back to war and gets killed. When the Count comes back home, she's like, um, I'm having a baby and it's yours. But we find out in the third play that it's not his. 
But that's okay, because then that child is able to marry <laughs> Florestine, who is the daughter of the Count and an unnamed other woman, which means that they're kosher. Um, and <laughs> these characters, of course, also appear in The Ghosts of Versailles. Peter Cazares, you're an expert on the third and a less well-known Figaro play because you created the role of the... Uh, Worthless Almaviva. Playboy, Count yeah. Almaviva, yeah. when they did the world premiere of uh, Ghost of Versailles at the Met in 1991. Yeah. So are you coming, I mean, is, do you feel a special connection with Count Almaviva? When oh, you God, no. Go <laughs> I mean, yeah, I actually, I suppose I do because I think, I think he's human. You know, he is, I, look, I am surrounded by people who are obsessed by cancel culture. So they don't want to see the Count on stage. They don't want to see this one on stage. They don't want to see that one on stage. I don't want to see that one on stage. I don't know who they want to see on stage half of the time, but it would seem to me a, probably a pretty boring opera. <laughs> I mean, who would they well, the want count, to see? I mean, the Count is sort of our antagonist. They would maybe want to see the swan from Parsifal before it gets shot. <laughs> because, you Innocence. know, it's guiltless and pure. That's right. But that is not, there's no dramatic conflict there. I don't mean to slam my students, but, you know, things have gone a little far in the sort of general bashing of opera. Opera is about people who are conflicted you and who are human and who are problematic. You want that E flat that never changes yeah, until Albrecht enters. I want, the, enters. I want the, Rhine, the Rhine maidens. They're pure and mean and uh, horrible. Anyway, um, I think that, um, and of course, students learn. And then they start to do, we just did Rake's Progress. So they learned a whole lot doing that, which was so much fun. And so it's such a great piece. Is anyone listening? It, <laughs> Um, and very Some strikingly, day. it's striking. a big piece. There's a lot of characters in it. Yes, and yeah, strikingly is... contemporary. I mean, yeah. amazing. Anyway, you know who my vote is for the oddly, the most innocent relationship in this piece is Marcellina's love for her for mm. Figaro, oh. which she thinks is romantic, mm. but in fact, it's because it's her son, and she somehow knows it. She's like, him, him, I must be near him. And she doesn't know why. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, that's why. Okay, <laughs> get rid of that, but now bring this. Another guilty mother. Another guilty Marcellina mother. Marcellina had a, you It's know, so great because it's like, in the, in you know, it's like, I knew there was something. It wasn't just his pretty face or that he looks good in tights. It's that <laughs> DNA. Looks like his daddy. Well, then there's the <laughs> thing, of course, and we will, we'll, I think because Kevin is, Kevin Burdett is such a genius and he'll go for it, and we have Figaro's who, who will also go for it. There's the moment where, or several moments, where Figaro can really take revenge upon Bartolo. <laughs> Padre mio, fate lo stesso. Dad, do the same thing as mom did. Give me a big old smooch right now. Arr, arr, arr. You know, and of course, because they're like each other, that's why they're antagonists. Mm. I mean, Actually, they are alike. It's sort of fitting that, that he turns out to be Bartolo's son because yes, they're both bufo bases yeah. who like to you know do sort of patter and are sort of in insufferable. Hopefully, with Susanna's influence, maybe Figaro won't grow up to become Dr. Bartolo. Oh, no, well, we know from the guilty mother he doesn't. <laughs> um, uh, let's talk about Marcellina, though, because uh, here's a, an interesting relationship where you, you really do flip. I mean, at the beginning of the opera, you're basically um, having a tug of war with her over this guy. And at the end of the opera, it's a very different relationship. Um, what's, what's that evolution like, Susanna and Marcellina? Or what are, the, what are the kind of dynamic, the interesting flavors to the dynamic there? I mean, it's a little hard to say in this production because we haven't rehearsed with Marcellina yet. Find it out And I think that we scene. will find that uh, dynamic, that particular one. But it, I think it's... Um, Susanna, in my estimation, does not have a has not had a motherly figure around for a long time, so it's a, she embraces this. She embraces having this motherly figure for her Maternal husband. Kind yes, of she she embraces that. So um, I think something gets completed in that beautiful sextet. Like mm. something is completed in Susanna and Figaro's world with. Marcellina and Bartolo. It's another time she smacks him. Yeah. That's right. By the way. That's right. Because <laughs> she finds Judy, him kissing, you know, embracing Marcellina. Right. She's like, you! Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, she just does it because she loves you. Right, and Marjolaine <laughs> right, and Bart right. will think it's so sweet. Oh, look how much she's such a good you know, wife mm-hmm. to him. She's so, uh, she, she cares, cares for him so, so much. much that she's going to beat him up. Smacks the crap out of him. Um, Marcellina also, well, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm I was working on a Marcellina she's thought. At the end of the day, there's a relief, like, oh my God, thank God, you know, she was another obstacle in the way of me getting married, and that's gone now, because... Well, and a person that you didn't like. I mean, yeah. when you, you, you start the opera, you, you sing this duet with her, and it's yeah. very, you're sort of, two sopranos singing a duet is a weird thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in this one, you kind of, you sing the same notes, and you're like trying to occupy the same space, almost, yeah. musically. Yeah, also, she's aware that there's something with her, with Marcellina and Figaro. So, we're rivals, you know, but in that moment, oh, no longer rival, great future mother-in-law better get her on my side right. you know like <laughs> you know we don't we don't want the wicked stepmother we want happy, happy you know there, there is something just from a musicology point of view or actually not musicology just I guess performance practice um, in the score the roles of the countess and Susanna and Carabino and Marcellina are all listed as soprano because this was before there was an actual thought of what a mezzo soprano they didn't was. have mezzos in those they days they didn't have them I mean they were and the, so the aria Marcellina's aria is Hella hard, as they would say. Um, it's really, really tough. And ex- extreme extension on top and goes low, goes high. But this is something, the op- that aria, which is really done, il capro e la capretta, the, the male goat and the female goat, son sempre in amistad. They're always, they're always happy. To, they're always friendly with each other. And you know the same with the ox and the cow. They're friendly. It's only human beings where the men and the women can't get along. What is wrong with us people? And that's one of the, again, she has a, Marcellina's um, big speech in the, in the play is a, is a feminist, very important feminist uh, manifesto, which got into, there was some trouble with censors, I believe. Yeah, they didn't perform, they cut that they in cut 1784 it. when the play was first done, but that was in the trial scene, which isn't really in the opera. Right. But um, uh, that whole, and that's... The, that the text you're referring to, actually, uh, Da Ponte stole that from Ariosto, from Orlando Furioso, and it's beautiful, beautiful passage. I'll share right. with you the real the thing of that, which is, you know, what on earth is wrong with the human race? Right. Look at all the animals. They don't, like, the, the wives aren't constantly beating up the husbands, as, right. as these, this couple shows. And, and that's why, she's, so when Marcellina hears that Figaro's going to go after, you know, F- Figaro thinks that Barbarina has delivered a letter from Susanna that was sent in earnest. So he's going to go to, you know, gather the forces. And Marcellina says, I'm going to go warn Susanna. She says, you know, I haven't known her. I, I, we, we're not that close, but she's a woman and we women have to stick together. It's that sort of female solidarity. Yes, we need to, and I trust her. And we have to show female solidarity. I mean, how, that's, how great is that? Also, and what a revelation of what kind of character she really is. She's, she's not just saying, well, my son must be right at all costs. Uh-uh. She's like, no, he's acting like a jerk. <laughs> Got to fix that. And, and this alliance, maybe that, uh, you know, Susanna was a worthy rival at the beginning. She actually has some estimation for yeah, Susanna. Yeah, respect, and definitely. And the two of them, the, which one is, am I going to, like, put my efforts on behalf um, at this point. Well, that's something that we'll certainly uh, watch you uh, folks develop uh, with Margaret Gershak, who's going to be, who's returning to Seattle Opera to do Marcellina. She was a wonderful Marcellina with us. Uh, uh, a mar- one marriage of Figaro ago. <laughs> Let's see, we've talked a little bit about um, Marcellina. We talked about Figaro. Uh, uh, talk about the Countess and Susanna's uh, very, very intimate, and again, this question of female solidarity with the Countess. Now, I understand that Mariuka Tepinen who is going to be your countess, Soraya, um, uh, who, wonderful, wonderful Finnish soprano, um, has also sung Susanna and has sort of, you know, like gone back and forth a little bit. Um, I mean, could you ladies flip over and sing the countess? Is it the kind of, is it vocally sort of uh, something that you could do? Uh, or is Susanna, that's... that's For me, yeah. vocally at the moment, Susanna is the role. Um, Hopefully, in the future, maybe I would I would go into the countess. What's the difference vocally? Um, well, we we talk about bigger and smaller voices. Um, it's t- w- w- how the tessitura lies in the arias, and how she needs to carry sometimes through some of the ensembles. And also, it depends on the the voices who are cast um, as the count and Figaro as well. And I think it also depends on the production and what what the 
director and the conductor want, whether they want a more mature sounding contest or a younger sound, can, sounding contest. And also it depends on the house you're in. There's a, a lot of factors that come into that. Um, but for me, at the moment, Susanna is, is vocally definitely um, where my, my voice is. Mm -hmm. Anya, do you, um, have you ever played around with any of these other... You, you sang Carabino when you were 14, <laughs> but <laughs> what about Carabino, any of the other? Yeah. Um, Did you ever sing Barbarina? Never sing I think of Barbarina as being sort of like the Susanna in training. Totally. If Carabino yeah. is the count in training, yeah. you know, sort of <laughs> aping him and learning how to be a libertine and a yeah. seducer, uh, you know, that or Barbarina. Or a man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, at some point, my agent had put me up for a couple of countesses, and I said, no, no, no. I don't know why. I just, I, f I feel like a, a kindred spirit with Susanna. Mm -hmm. um, but I, of course, someday maybe would love to explore that other side of the show. It would be really interesting. I've, I've done that with some other operas where you get to be all these different characters. And what about singing what, for many, I think, is the pro most ravishingly beautiful number in the opera, the letter duet? You sing that, it's a duet. I mean, <laughs> how many duets do you sing in this opera? I mean, you, ha you have really the, just the one. No, you have two arias. Let me correct that. You have the big aria at the end, Devieni. You have the aria where you're getting Carabino in drag, which is an aria technically, but I don't know if it... There's also the appendix aria, the Moto di Gioia, which is never done. Oh, I don't know, even know Except that one. Except if you're Cecilia Bartoli. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is that a big showpiece kind of... No. Not particularly, no. No. I mean, uh, yeah, I think the idea being that the social status, the countess has, she's higher in the sort of pecking chain, so she gets a bigger aria or a big, more flamboyant aria. And also, like, because your aria, um, Devieni, it has an accompanied recitative because you're pretending to be the countess, mm. and she would have an accompanied recitative. <laughs> As a lowly servant, Susanna wouldn't rate a fully accompanied recitative, right? I mean, do you, do you and Figaro sing love duets to each other? I mean, are you, like, does that... There is very little love music for the two characters mm. in the show. No, I d th they don't particularly sing love, love duets because they, I don't think they need to. They probably did all that when they first met each other. <laughs> you know, and they've said they've already a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, and I really hope they do. I don't think they sing to each other during the wedding ceremony. I mean, like, the, you know, the love song that Carabino has written is this very sort of idea of love. I, that's not really... I can't... It's hard for me to imagine Figaro and Susanna doing that except in parody... Yeah, of I, somebody else. Definitely, I think they would well, probably. Because I think Figaro and Susanna are already at the, I took the trash out, now it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, somehow they've gotten the there already. The joy and the domesticity. Yeah. It's too practical for anything mm. truly romantic. That's why it's more about fighting, you know, mm. hitting each other as their physical yeah. contact. They have the little love part party at the party. very end. Party, mm. party, mio dolce. Mm. Yeah. It's, that's very sweet. That's their love duet. Yeah. But yeah. you know, I should say, talking about Susanna duets, I, I believe it's not giving anything away. We have a wonderful, wonderful conductor for this, Aleftina Yoffe, who is who we're so lucky to have here working on this. And there is a duet that Susanna has with Carabino. And when we got to that in the in the run through the music run the other day, Very the Susannas fast. were like, "What?" Because it's really. I mean, it's fast anyway. I mean, it's usually like pa 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 da pa 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 is what I've usually heard, but this is literally pa 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 da 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 pa da 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 da, and the pianists were like ah ah ah, and so it has to go really fast and light. It's it's the little duet where you're running around. Oh, this door's locked. That door's locked. Jump out the window. That that thing is that. I mean, is it as nerve wracking on stage to do that as it sounds? Because yeah, it's in a yes. <laughs> it's worse for Carabino. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Carabino's getting all the stuff. Totally. Oh, he's got a collect. He's got a like half. He's half. He drag has his he, clothing, yeah. but he has to figure out how he's getting out. And mm. you basically, well, you'll see. She's just like, no, no, you can't. No, you, you what? You're gonna go? No, don't go out the window. <laughs> and then hijinks That's ensue. That's so good to know. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. It's very yeah. different from our last wanted, production. I wanted to say that <gasps> to you. But tell us a little bit about that letter duet. I mean, it is one of the, the pieces, I think, from this opera, the things that have gotten pulled out and used sort of in movies and TV and so forth are Non Pion Dry, the Overture, uh, and probably the letter duet is up there, you know, which, which is, you're taking dictation. It may be one of the only opera <laughs> things we can do where, they're, you know, someone's taking, you're, she's coming up with the words and you're writing it down, but you're singing the same phrases in the same notes and so your voices again like with fighting with marcellina you're sort of uh, somehow m mirror images of each other um what's that like and do you try to blend or do you try to make your voice sound distinct or, or, how, or are you trying to 
trick the count that he can't tell which is Susanna and which is the countess. This is the, like, the letter that's the alluring, come on out to the garden tonight, we're going to have a good time. I think it's, um, so this is the duet that most people know as the Shawshank Redemption duet. Mm -hmm. It's the scene played on the record when he locks himself in the room. And I think, it's interesting, it, it used to terrify me to sing this duet because it, it is the most beautiful thing in the world. Until, um, I, I think my husband said, who used to be a conductor and pianist, and he said, you don't have to do anything. Like this is the, it's there. You don't have to do anything on top of it. You just sing this, you just sing the notes. And so I actually try not to think too hard about it, just like, it's repeating it, doing what she's doing, and then it and and then it is interesting to do it with different voices, right? Because then at a certain point you do. Are you conscious of trying to match her or echo her? I mean, she goes la. I don't think that echoing, but when our voices join, there's some sort of. Le I used to sing with my sister a lot, and so we somehow learned how to like lean our voices into each other. And at least just in the sing through yesterday. I felt that Helena and I could do that with, you know, you, when you have good colleagues, it's like there's just a way that you lean your voices into each other. You're not trying to stick out mm -hmm. in, that, in that moment. Yeah, I, it's funny, dramatically, I, I just don't think of it as the, the beautiful music in this piece at all. It never occurred to me as, as that. And something I find really interesting is that in the recitative before, and we, have, we haven't yet discovered this, but Susanna says, Qui o scrivi? She says, you know, scrivi, scrivi, write this down. She says, scrivi me. And we have to remember that in this time, Susanna probably couldn't write very well. She probably had never been taught to write. And the Countess is saying these beautiful, poetic words, and sh Susanna is discovering them. So she's repeating, you know, te firato, like the, the winds and this. Oh, wow, gosh, <laughs> my, my countess, she's a poet. <laughs> oh, this is genius. You know, so there's a discovery in it. And I think it's more a fizz of excitement. And the two are on the same team. And it's like, right, we've got a plan now. You know, I don't have to go and meet the count. Uh, and this and that, you know, we've got it solid. This is fun. This is becoming something fun now. I'm not as stressed as I was before when I'm going to woo this guy. And I think there's the joy in the discovering of the text, the joy in the discovering that her countess has this side to her as well. The because playful side of the countess, yeah. which you don't really yeah. And also the countess is saying, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. He's going to mm. understand it. Yeah. He, he'll get the point. Yeah, and I, th I think that's the joy in it. It's the two, these two, it's like we talked about, you know, the, 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 f the women coming together and this mutual respect. And I think in that moment, Susanna goes, hey, She's more than just my countess in this pretty face and this poor woman who was, you know, doting over a husband who's um, trying to deceive her. She's, she's got a spark in her and I think she really admires her and respects her in that moment. It's, it's very interesting that you guys go to the drama and, and the music, it'll just happen, you know, if mm. you can do that. I mean, this is another, I guess, one other question I have which is about singing Mozart in general. Um, you know, Mozart is, gets done a lot. You probably, you know, uh, sung a lot of it, but... Uh, it tends to be thought of as something special, something either super terrifying or something that's actually very, very tricky. I don't know what, if you have any general thoughts about Mo going into Mozart or, or if you think of yourself as a Mozart singer. And, and Peter, if you, if you as, as a musician, if you wanna. It's uh, exposed. It's really, really exposed. It's not as exposed as some bel canto things, but it's exposed. De Vieni is total, there's nothing to hide behind. Despiltness, exposed, unauda, exposed, everything, that you, you can't hide any technical flaws, which is why people who hear auditions, if you are a person who could sing Mozart, they want to hear you sing Mozart, because they're basically like saying, and where are the flaws? Is it intonation? Is it line? Is it legato? Is it that they sing beautifully, but there's no sense of what the text is? Because all of that stuff it's will immediately, apparent. immediately, screamingly apparent. Are you conscious of that when you're doing this music, that it is but sort of They're all tight here at Seattle Opera, <laughs> so they know what they're doing. I, I did this, when I did this two years ago, I had the pleasure of working with um, Maestro Carlo Rizzi on this, and Car Carlo does not do much Mozart anymore. He does mostly, you know, your, your big league Toscas and, you know, Bohems. Um, so it was a real joy to work with him on this, and... We didn't have him for many rehearsals in the room until we, we got to stage. But when he was with us, he just didn't look at the arias, didn't look at any of the ensembles. Recitativo. 
we only did russet. Oh. And I'll never forget him um, talking about gesticulating and um, how, how to use the body. Um, how an Italian yeah, would, would do Yeah, and he that. said that he was once driving in the countryside with his um, wife who's um, from Wales, and he was on the phone to his a property manager about buying a house and got off the phone and she said, what were you arguing about? He said, oh, no, we're not arguing. We, we are Italian. <laughs> and I think that, to me, is is the most important part of any Mozart opera and, and any anything with Italian recitativo is to remember this is Italian. These, you know, these, these are Latin characters as well. You know, yes, it's, it's Italian language set in Spain. You know, that these people are passionate and they're big personalities. And I think finding the balance in the recitativo is far more important. And then you just let the beautiful music do the work for, for itself. And Mo Mozart is medicine for the voice. It's the thing you come back to when you're going, oh, something's feeling a bit funny here. I know, I need to get my Mozart out. Sing a little Mozart and that'll yeah. sort of, it's the exercise. Yeah. It's I think everyone should sing a bit, a little bit of Mozart every day. Just everyone, not just singers. <laughs> Five years ago, when I did this production in Washington with Ryan McKinney, who will be doing our uh, opening cast, Figaro, he had just come from doing Amfortas in, in uh, Parsifal in Pyrite. And <clears throat> uh, he'd done a performance the night before, gotten on a plane, um, come to Washington, and sort of the day after he was showing up, I'm like, are you okay to sing us, you know, musical today? He said, are you kidding? I've been looking forward to this. This is like medicine. Mm. Um, you remind me of recuperating from Wagner. To, really? Well, uh, that was a fantastic but very complicated production um, with lots of, you know, serious con con uh, controversy, uh, but worth it. Um, the late great designer uh, Ming Cho Lee used to say, Figaro is a great problem because it is based on a French play and it's a Spanish story written to an Italian text by an Austrian. Whose mother tongue was German. Whose mother tongue was German. You have one too many. <laughs> You've got to get rid of the Spanish. And he, he would talk about that in the designs. Oh. He said that if you sort of, that it's French, it definitely has a French flair and it's Italian. And we also can understand that it's from, you know, classical music. He said, but if you sort of overlay it with too much heavy black furniture, you're kind of cooked. It has about as much to do with, it's set outside of Seville. Yes, it has about as much to do with Spain as, you mentioned Fidelio earlier. I think that also takes place yeah. in Spain, so theoretically. Advice to designers. <laughs> One too many. I have one more question for our uh, uh, panel here, and then of course we will do want to uh, get some questions from um, those of you here and also uh, those of you online. But um, uh, my last one is really, at the end of the day, what has Susanna learned? And maybe this is, you have to remember <laughs> the last time you did it, uh, like when you get to the end of the, the crazy day, what was the sort of the big takeaway for her? The thing that she didn't, wasn't expecting or you know, I've already said this, but I think for me it's watching the Countess forgive mm. the Count. I, it may change after we do this one, but for me, it's that moment. It's because I think they've just been going minute by minute and not really sure. She didn't really think about the end result, like that very last moment. Oh, what is going to happen when this all comes out, all this whole charade is yeah. done? What is going to happen? And so when, not just when the Count says, ah, oh, but when the Countess comes and forgives him. And then you sing that most incredible soprano yeah. line. It's you and the Countess both mm -hmm. sing those big high notes mm -hmm. in the ah ha tu ti yeah. I think it's, it's funny that you mentioned this today, Peter, Bridgerton, um, which I love. Um, I think there's, a, in the moment when the Countess forgives the Count, it makes me think about when, Susanna comes into the room in Act Two, and the Countess says, "Look, you don't understand with these with these modern men and these marriages. You know they're this and that." And she, oh, but you and you and Figaro, it's it's not like that for you. you think, oh God, she's getting married today, and I'm just telling her that it's going to be awful. You know, when actually I think in that moment for Susanna, it's like, thank God I married Figaro. Thank God I am not in the life where they have to be with this this person, you know, a count and a countess together. Thank God I had some luxury of choice to be with someone who I actually love. That she learns, she gets that perspective yeah. from the events yeah. of the crazy Yeah, crazy and I day. think that it's hopeful for her that she will never be put in that position that the countess has been. You know, I um, had a conversation once about Mozart and comedy, etc., with the wise and wonderful 
great performer and great director, Renato Capecchi, who himself was a fantastic, I think he was both a Figaro and a Count. And we, it, I, would, I had seen a production uh, which he'd been in as Don Alfonso, and we were talking about German ways of doing things and Italian ways of doing things, which are very different. Um, <clears throat> but he said, you know, the thing is, in Anglo in Anglo-Saxon fairy tales, it ends with, and they got married and were ha and were happy and ever, lived, you know, happily, were ha ever lived after. happily ever after. Just like the Barber of Seville, they They're, get married and aren't and they going right, to live happily ever and after? And the difference in an Italian fairy tale is it begins so there's this man and a woman and they're married. <laughs> and that's when the comedy begins. Not a fairy tale, but a comedy. Because the, so to me, it's, I think in a funny way, Susanna understands, oh, this, this, this is not the last day this is gonna happen. This is gonna be happening all the time with this man. I, am, I, I trust him that he probably, you know, he's not gonna go skirt chasing, but I'm gonna have to be, if this is gonna work, I need to hold on to the checkbook. I need to make sure, you know, that he keeps his spending in, in, in order. I need to make sure who makes the travel arrangements. I'm going to be in charge. I also think Suzanne is the most intelligent character uh, in the, I mean, I think Figaro is intelligent. I think the Count is intelligent. The Count is clearly a forward-thinking dude, but he has a little bit of testosterone poisoning, so that sort of, <laughs> you know, gets in his way. I mean, that was the case in the marriage of, in the Barber of Seville, that I really want that girl, Figaro, you have to figure out how to get her for me, because I, I'm, I can't quite Well, you know, but you know, the other thing that we myself. forget, talk about creepers, so he meets her walking in the Prado in Madrid. In the and park. In, in the park, outside the, you know, the outside the, where, the, where the museum is, and he's like, that girl, that girl, I've got to find that girl. And Bartolo gets winds of, wind of it, so he moves her lock, stock, and barrel to Seville. From Madrid, from which Madrid, is hundreds of miles, and yeah. then Figaro, uh, then the Count learns of it and is trying to find her, and thinks he has found her, and indeed he has found her, and he realizes that morning, and in fact Bartolo has moved her because of this guy who was stalking her in the park. I mean, it's like whoa. That was a fairy tale. That in was a fairy the tale. Mid, uh, 1770s. So this man stalks a woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, and here we are. It's 2022. Well, it's like 244 years later. We're almost at 250 years with this story now. It's kind of amazing. Um, questions from our crowd for our Susannas, for our director. And uh, I think Alex has a uh, mic and can uh, run around and get busy. Or, uh, Ayana, do you have uh, anybody on chat? If you do, let us know. We've got a question here. Uh, uh, one of the Susannas mentioned the house characteristics of various houses. I'd love to hear you comment about our house. What, what do you feel when you sing in it? What are its uh, points of comparison to other places you, McCall you're Hall familiar with? McCall singing, and um, I, may, I don't know any of you you can remember singing in Bellevue. It's, it's pure joy, honestly. It, the acoustics are stunning. And also the audience here is, is always wonderful and interested and that that's you feel that as a performer on stage but it's a really really special acoustic here i agree um i grew up not far from seattle i grew up in issaquah and i did come to see a show in the old space what was it called Jonathan, the old theater? We just called it the Seattle Opera House. They changed the name to McCall Hall when it was rebuilt in 2003. Right, so I saw one or two productions before that, um, before I really knew I wanted to be an opera singer. Um, and then, and I've sung at a lot of the regional houses and I find coming back here um, very deeply satisfying. But not just because it's a beautiful theater, because it feels like home, because I grew up here, because I did the Young Artists Program. And every time I, I step onto that stage, it's very comforting. It's also just, uh, I love when cities have a space that feels filled with art. And I love, I love that our location is here now to rehearse in and to walk out to the Seattle Center and have the rep there and just, you know, be able to walk by those lights. Oh my gosh. 
That's right. That was the um, the Norma. Norma. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you've also sung. I mean, you've sung all over the world. You've sung at the Scala. You've sung here and there. I mean, and on our stage, as most recently, the Duchess of Krakentorp. But I know there was a lot of other things on the new Maca Hall. I mean, do you want to say anything? It's about It's a great that? acoustic. Look, I will say the first time I sang in a small, I sang at the Deutsche uh, Staatsoper Unter den Linden, which was about 900 seats, and I was like, oh, that's why they can do those pianos, because you know you're. 100 feet from the farthest seat, and the house is small. Really intimate. Really intimate. This um, acoustic is fantastic. I mean, the Met has a good acoustic, too. The trick at the Met is, because it's so big, you walk out there and you think, well, I'd better scream, which is not healthy and is not what anybody should do. So one learns. You do you need to, or you just no, sort of feel that way because of the way it looks? No, the clever ones don't. That you can actually do all of the yeah, dynamics you exactly. practiced. Um, but. I mean, it is different from singing in an 800 or a 900 seat house here, or in a big American house. You know, the, there was a time in the sort of 40s and 50s, especially after the war, when there were a whole bunch of theaters that went into North America, all through Canada, like uh, uh, at the fairgrounds in Dallas, all these houses were done by the same people. They're all about 2,300, 2,400 seats. They're all big. Um, some of them were more successful than others. Um, and it was a way of getting, you know, road shows in and out, not necessarily so successful for opera. But we now have, you know, a couple of fantastic, I mean, more than a couple of really, really great theaters in this country. Um, and this is one of them. So I'm really proud to have worked here so much. Soraya, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about the, the, the show that didn't happen, the Marriage of Figaro that you did in Cardiff for Welsh National Opera, which was then supposed to go and sort of tour. Yeah. Um, and that's not something that we kind of do anymore in the US, but that's how that company... Yeah, so there's, there's a few touring companies in the UK. Um, so Welsh National Opera... And how tours. big would then, I mean, how many different places would you take it and how big are those oh, places, do um, you know? How many places are we going to? Um, I think that Welsh National Opera is about 1,800, um, the capacity, and it's a um, modern theatre. It's the Millennium Centre in Cardiff, which is beautiful. It's re on Cardiff Bay, a re really, really stunning place. But it's considerably smaller than Macaw Hall. Yeah, yeah. And um, the touring theatres, most of them um, are Frank Matcham theatres, the architect Frank Matcham, um, Victorian, and really beautiful. Um, backstage leaves a lot to be desired in those theatres, I have to say, when we were not the priority back then. Um, and often interesting wing space. And of course, when you're touring a, a production, um, the set sometimes doesn't quite fit and it has to be adapted dependent on which theatre you are in. So sometimes you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go on stage here. Oh, wait, no, there's a wall there, you know. And, and I forget once I was touring a production with Welsh National Opera of Sweeney Todd, and it was all on um, uh, shipping containers, and I was doing Joanna, and I was about to step forward, and the whole shipping container shunted back, and I nearly, like, hit the deck, like, about four metres up in the air. Um, so, yeah, touring Safety is interesting. when you're going from theatre yeah. to theatre to theatre, and um, who knows what's there. Yeah, and the, the, it's a ver varying capacities. Um, from anything from around uh, maybe about 800 would be the smallest to this place is like the Liverpool Empire, which is up in the northwest of England, um, which is like a 2,500 seat theatre, one of the biggest theatres in the UK. Um, but then I've toured like in, in France in some tiny, tiny theatres where literally the wing space is like this big and you, they can just see you. You know, you're waiting off stage and hello. Um, you know, and a, a lot of like great little Baroque pieces, um, pieces with smaller orchestras. So it was interesting actually talking about doing a, a, a motor opera in a bigger space. Um, also turned to the screw, which of course is a chamber opera. And doing that here was interesting. And it also affects how... Um, I mean, it's very curious, but the, t the turn of the screw on the main stage worked. I mean, it's oh. got a tiny little 11-piece yeah, orchestra, but we because heard Because of it. this guy. <laughs> you know, that's, what, that's why it worked. It was direct, it directed in the right way. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. suppose you have to sort of scale. Although, I mean, you, you sort of supersized that... Um, Ish. That, <laughs> that production, that's true. Yeah. Uh, you had to do this as well, uh, uh, touring and uh, singing sometimes. You were telling me once about... Uh, it was turn of the screw in a kibbutz... In Israel, that happened. You were telling the story where you yes. were like, you were like, go stand with a chicken and sing your offstage. Well, la, 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 I, you la, know, la. I had to sing. You have to sing your first ma <laughs> offstage. So whenever I would do that, I would find out where in this theater <laughs> is offstage. There, I think in Frankfurt was interesting because the only place I could get to was the kitchen, because I mean the offstage place di went directly into the kitchens. Well, they didn't care. 
<laughs> so I was trying to sing while they were like cooking. <laughs> that didn't work so well, so I had to come a little bit close. Then they're like, you're too close, you're too close, whatever. Um, in the kibbutz, I had to sing in two fields, um, and it was a chicken kibbutz. Um, so that's where the, you know they raise chickens. So I just was singing to the chickens, but it was also a little bit interesting because, you know, <coughs> Quint sings this line, which is like, <laughs> and people were like, "Is that somebody chanting the call to prayer for mu Muslims?" Because it sounded like you know cantillation. So it was strange. You're like, "No, it's Benjamin Britten." <laughs> The, the strange things that that, uh, that turn up. Any other questions for our group here? Questions now? Ask your marriage of free will questions now or never. And if Jana is giving me a look, <laughs> uh, I have a question actually. Um, uh, I'm, my name's Alex. I work for Seattle Opera. I'm curious. So, a lot of the same characters from the Barbersville carry into the marriage of Figaro. Except Susanna. Susanna, we meet for the first time in the marriage of Figaro. What do you imagine she was up to uh, in the days of the Barber of Seville? Wait, Maybe she was too young. Prequel. I don't know. But the youth of Susanna. Me, or anybody? Uh, any of you? Yeah. I mean, I, look. I think Susanna uh, is slightly older than the Countess, and is certainly more knowing than the Countess. And I think Figaro is also older than the Count, and more. Uh, we know from figure from the Barber of Seville that he has had quite quite a past history. His past story is his backstory is quite rich, um, including having been a veterinarian and all sorts of interesting things. Um, I think Susanna probably came from a poorish family, but got an education and learned how to fend for herself and was lucky to get this gig uh, as a la lady's maid for the Countess. Maybe it was not her first such gig, um, and. Uh, and I think she has made herself indispensable because she, in her way, is like a Figaro to the, she's like a female Figaro. She's a fix it. Uh, she does everything that needs to be, she, she makes things possible. She makes things, she's not an enabler, um, but she makes things happen for the Countess. And she, I think, sort of keeps the Countess, you know, the Countess doesn't have a personal assistant that we know of, but I can imagine Susanna saying, don't forget, the Count's expecting you for luncheon. Don't forget, we have the girls from the village at 3 o'clock. <laughs> you know, and when, and when the Countess, as in this day, says, I have the vapors, I'm not coming downstairs, because they make a whole thing in the play about how she's actually staying in her night clothes, which is why that ends up becoming a scandalous thing later on in Act 2. She hasn't made her appearance. And Susanna is the one who has to tell everyone that, I have no doubt. I mean, we don't... We don't have a Mrs. Hughes from Downton Abbey sort of showing up and saying, you know, her ladyship is indisposed. I think that would be Susanna. So it's, you know, it's a, um, I guess it in, involves a lot of executive function, which is not something you usually ascribe to opera characters, but is certainly true of both Figaro and definitely Susanna. The fixer, the, uh, the effective, I mean, sometimes think like Figaro thinks of himself as this person, and usually what's, why it's a comedy is he's not really very good at it. A lot of the time, it sort of blows up in he his face. He gets an A for effort. <laughs> um, Susanna can somehow be less egotistical about it and actually more competent, but that's uh, that person who's sort of, uh, you don't necessarily notice, because she's just there, smiling and, and oh, making... She's like the cleanup squad, isn't she? <laughs> you know, when a crime happens, in comes Susanna. Okay, let's fix it. Practical pig, do you use that saying over here? Oh, no, what, tell me about pra pra practical pig. It's like, you know, she's going to get it sorted and like, okay, it's all right. <laughs> Got it all under control. Like this, you, that, you that, to, that. You boom. have to translate from the British. This yeah, is the most wonderful pig. expression I just learned this. She's going to get it sorted. Going to get it sorted. And you, you can use sorted as a, as a noun as well, as, it, mm. <laughs> as well as a verb. Um, yeah, she just gets things sorted. She's a sorter. Yeah. Well, the opposite of me. That's why this is hard. Oh, come Not on. Executive function. <laughs> well, okay, unless we've got any uh, other burning questions, we will uh, conclude. And thank you for joining me this evening, uh, Peter Kuzer, Soraya Mafi, and Anya Matanovich. And we look forward very much to opening uh, with Marriage Figure on May 7th. And we'll talk to everybody after those performances to find out more of the, the fun, what's going on backstage. I, I just have to say thanks to Seattle Opera for putting together not one but two incredible casts. 
incredible cast. I mean, it's such a it's a, such it's a, a real luxury. Uh, it's a delight to listen to and to experience in the room and to see, as as you said, I I learned early on that a director is only as good as his singers, um, and that if a smart director will learn how to edit and will learn how to pay attention to his singers and sometimes push back and sometimes accept, but if you have the right singers, you will get together you will get to something that no one would have figured out on their own. And that's when it becomes really fun. And we should say for your composition student, yes, three hours plus, I mean, this is, we're not doing all those extra arias in this particular production. We'd love to hear, you know, Maggie sing Marcellina's aria and, and so forth. But, um, so it's probably gonna be, I don't know, three hours and five minutes, 10 minutes, something Ish. like that. Yeah. But with so many great voices in it, that that's gonna go right by and you won't, you won't notice. Assuming you all do your jobs right, uh, the Are night of. Are you kidding? <laughs> Repeatedly. Anyways, thank you all for being here with us tonight. Thank you, uh, folks, for thank this discussion. You. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thank you. Thanks for coming.